Assalamualaikum and selamat sejahtera. This is a recording for A Rose for Emily, narrated by Nick Nurul Aisha and Mardina Sofia. So the start of the story is Miss Emily Grayson died at the age of 74. Jeffersonians turned out in a great number for the funeral. The men to pay homage to a fallen monument and the woman mainly out of curiosity to view the inside of her house, which no one save an old man servant, a combined gardener, and a cook, had seen in the least 10 years. The house, built in 1870s, is an elegant edifice with cupolas and balconies. Back in the 1894, Colonel Satoris, the mayor, exempted her from paying tax. Colonel Satoris created a story that her late father had once lent money to the town, and as a means of repaying, he will remit Emily taxes from this day on into property. Many years later, other mayors tried to collect from her, but she always sent their tax bills back. One day, city officials went to her house to collect the taxes. They rose when Emily entered. Miss Emily, a fat woman with a small frame who leaned on a cane, appeared and said, I have no taxes in Jefferson, Colonel Satoris explained it to me. But there is nothing on the books to show that, we, you see. We must go by the sea, Colonel Satoris. I have no taxes in Jefferson. But Miss Emily, see Colonel Satoris. Colonel Satoris has been dead for almost 10 years. I have no Jeff. I have no taxes in Jefferson. Toby, the Negro appeared. Show this gentleman out. So she vanquished them, horse and foot, just as she vanquished their fathers 30 years before about the smell. That was two years after her father's death and a short time after her sweetheart, the one we believe would marry her, had deserted her. After her father's death, she went out very little. After her sweetheart went away, people hardly saw her at all. A neighbor, a woman, complained to the mayor, Judge Stevens, 80 years old. Judge Stevens told the woman it was probably just a dead rat or a snake. The next day, he received two more complaints, one from a man who came in different deprecation. We must really do something about it, Judge. I'll be the last one in the world to bother Miss Emily, but we've got to do something. That night, the board of aldermen met. Three grey beards and one younger man, a member of the rising generation. One man, a young man, told the three elderly members that the board should tell her to clean up the place in a specific amount of times. Judge Stevens expressed his opposition to the idea. So rather than issuing an order, after midnight, four men crossed Emily's, Miss Emily's lawn and slunk about the house like burglars, sniffing along the base of the brick wood and at the cellar openings. They broke open the cellar door and sprinkled lime there and in all the outbuildings. After a week or two, the smell went away. That was right about time when people began to pity her. People in our town, remembering how old lady wept and her great aunt had gone completely crazy at last, believed that the Graysons held themselves a little too high for what they really were. Emily's father had even drifted all of Emily's suitor, presumably because he thought they were not good enough for her. So when she got to be 30 and was still single, we were not pleased exactly, but vindicated. Even with insanity in the family, she wouldn't have turned down all her chances if they had really materialized. When her father died, Emily inherited the house, but that was all. Consequently, she had no money to speak of. Being left alone and a pauper, she had become humanized. Now she too would know the old thrill and the old despair of a penny more or less. When townspeople called on her to offer condolences, she told them her father was not dead. She did that for three days, with the ministers calling on her and the doctors trying to persuade her to let them dispose of the body. Just as they were about to resort to law and force, she broke down, and they buried her father quickly. She was sick for a long time. When she recovered and people saw her again, she had short hair, making her look much younger. One summer, 
a construction crew began installing new sidewalks for the city. The foreman was a northerner, Homer Baron, who became famous in town for his big love. Presently, we began to see him and Miss Emily on Sunday afternoons driving in the yellow wheeled buggy and the mesh team of bays from the livery stable. The ladies all said, of course a Grison would not think seriously of a northerner, a day laborer. Folks weren't sure, but they felt sorry for her as the last of the Grisons. They just said, poor Emily. She carried her head high enough, even when we believed that she was fallen. I want some poison, the best you have, she said to the druggist. The druggist named several arsenic, Miss Emily said. Is that a good one? So, the next day, we all said she will kill herself, and we said it would be the best thing. When we first saw her with Homer Baron, we said she will marry him. Then we said she will persuade him yet, because Homer was not a marrying type. He remarked that he liked men, and it was known that he drank with the younger men in the Elks Club. For that reason, women eventually began to think her relationship with Baron was setting a bad example to the young people. So, they had a Baptist minister call on her. After speaking with her, the Baptist minister refused to say what passed between them. Meanwhile, the minister's wife wrote a letter to Emily's relatives in Alabama, and two of her cousins come and visit her. After a time, Emily bought a men's grooming set at the local jewelers. On each of the silver pieces appeared the latest HB. She also purchased men's clothing, including a nightshirt, and we said they are married. We were really glad. We were glad because the two female cousins were even more grisen than Miss Emily had ever been. So, we were not surprised when Homer Baron, the streets had been finished some time since, was gone. We were a little disappointed that there was not a public blowing off, but we believed that he had gone on to prepare for Miss Emily's coming or to give her a chance to get rid of the cousins. Within three days, Homer Baron was back in town. A neighbor saw the Negro man admit him at the kitchen door at dusk one evening. And that was the last we saw of Homer Baron and of Miss Emily for some time. The Negro man went in and out with the market basket, but the front door remained closed. But for almost six months, she did not appear on the streets. When we next saw Miss Emily, she had grown fat and her hair was turning grey. When she was around 40, however, she received students whom she taught in China painting. She did that for six or seven years. After younger men came to power in the town, the number of her students began to dwindle. Eventually, she had no students at all and closed her door to everyone. Daily, monthly, yearly, we watched the Negro grow grayer and more stupid, going in and out with the market basket. Each December, we sent her a test notice, which would be written by the post office a week later, unclaimed. Now and then, we would see her in one of the downstairs windows looking or not looking at us. She had evidently shut up the top floor of the house, and so she died, fell ill in the house filled with dust and shadows, with only a doddering negro man to wait on her. We did not even know she was sick. We had long since given up trying to get any information from the negro. He talked to no one. She died in one of the downstairs rooms. After Toby let the townspeople in for the ceremony, he goes away and doesn't return. The town ladies stand around whispering. Many of the oldest men, some of whom wear confederate uniforms, are out on porch or lawn talking about having danced with Emily or courted her. Already we knew that there was one room in that region above stairs which no one had seen in 40 years and which would have to be forced. They waited until Miss Emily was decently in the ground before they opened it. 
The awareness of breaking down the door seemed to fill this room with pervading dust. A thin acrid pall as of the tomb seemed to lie everywhere open this room deck and furnished as for a bridal. On a table are the grooming set for Homer Baron, a collar and a tie. On the bed is rotting corpse of Homer Baron in an attitude of embrace. Then we noticed that in the second pillow was the indentation of a head. One of us lifted something from it and leaning forward, that faint and invisible dust dry and acrid in the nostrils, we saw a long strand of iron grey hair. Okay, Assalamualaikum Aisha. So, after reading the whole story, I just want to ask about your review and your thoughts on A Rose for Emily from William Faulkner. So, the first question that I am curious to your answer is, what do you think of the story? I truly love the story, especially the fact on how the other seems so interested in exploring several aspects of the human specifically depression and what events repression can lead to. At the end of the story, we can see the destructive effects of repression and to comment upon the power of a selfish father in the future of his daughter, whose happiness he held in his hand, a betrayal of not only his position as Emily's father, but also his duty as a human being to help another achieve a full life. Okay, so the second question is, what is your favorite part from the whole story? My favorite part is when the townspeople break into the one room above stairs which no one had seen in 40 years. When they entered the room and saw a corpse lay in the bed, I immediately got goosebumps. But at the same time, I was surprised to finally realize who the corpse was. Further wrap up, the other successfully described the scene let us to finally understand the whole story. So I think this is the best plot twist ever. Okay, I understand. The third question is, do you support the protagonist? No, I will never support anyone to do bad things. And in this case, uh, the protagonist just killed her love interest. I know that she might be sick because of some circumstances. But I hardly protest what she just did. Okay, that's very true. The fourth question is, what were your emotions while reading the story? I pity Emily for what she had endured all this time. And I also felt a bit sad for the fact that the character Homer Baron is dead in the end because he is actually a nice person and he deserved the world. Okay, the last question for you is Discuss what you love or hate the most about the story What I love the most about the story is the scene where Emily and Hope Baron were together driving in a buggy on Sunday afternoons and I thought of them as a tableau in this scene mm, They're very cute Okay, next I will ask you a few questions too. Okay. If you could be any character in the book, who would you be? Okay, for me, if I could be any character in the book, I would choose to be Emily's sweetheart who left her because um, I would rather leave than to stay in a toxic environment such as Emily's father always looking down at people and also Emily who is so obsessive with love to the point that she would kill Homer Baron. So I would rather be that sweetheart who left her at the start of the story. Oh, okay. And next question. Would you read any other book from the other? Yes. I would read any other books because I love his complex writing. And I love how it, he introduces me to new words that I don't use on daily basis. So, did you race to the end of the book or was it more of a slow read? Uh, to me, at first, it was more of a slow read because the book explained the whole Texas and Jeffersonian deportation thing. But as I was 
going to the middle, I was more curious to why the book emphasized a lot on Emily's house and the smell. So for me, I even tried to paste everything together. So at the end, it was more of a fast read and it was very worth it. Okay, I agree with you. Then what do you think the title meant or symbolizes? I think the title symbolizes Emily's love life because you know roses are often given as to express a affection, right? So I think because when Emily was younger, she never had the chance to accept any roses because her father was very strict. So hence, I think when she killed Homer, it seemed as if Emily had preserved the idea of love forever as Homer could never to be vanquished. That concludes the title, A Rose for Emily, as in Love for Emily. Okay, um, based on your preferences, read the story out of 5 stars. Okay. Um, I really enjoy reading A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner, so based on my preference, I would give this story a 4 out of 5 stars because I am a huge fan of mysteries and I would have never guessed the ending so the whole story just shocked me to the core right. Yay. Okay, that's the end thank you for answering my questions and thank you for answering my questions too okay that's the end of our book review from Mardina and Aisha thank you everyone